You started off in venture capital, you worked in product at Dropbox, then you left to form Vanta. What is the problem that you're trying to solve here? So really broadly, we're trying to help software companies be more trustworthy with their customers and build that trust. And so the way we do that is help those software companies improve their security and then go off and prove it, uh, often through something like a compliance audit, a SOC 2, GDPR, HIPAA, you know, showing that they're taking these regulations seriously and really using them as an opportunity to build trust with their customers and ultimately grow their revenue and businesses. Now, David, I know a lot of investors are being very careful about where they put their money right now. What attracted you to this company? Well, v Vance is a company we've been interested in for a long time. Um, we started to notice a number of years ago that many of our portfolio companies were using Vanta. You know, we invest in a lot of SaaS companies and we saw Vanta becoming a critical enabler uh, for SaaS companies that want to sell into enterprises. Basically, if you want to sell enterprise deals, you have to get a SOC 2 certification. You have to do 27,001. You have to comply with PCI and GDPR. And we saw that the market was shifting from using high-priced, expensive, and slow consultants to using a software platform like Vanta. So we've wanted to invest in Vanta for a long time. And when the opportunity came up, despite there being this downturn, we really jumped at the opportunity. So Christina, talk to us about this Costco coffee only approach. I mean, I don't, I love actually food <laughs> at Costco, but I understand that you guys have been very conscious about, you know, keeping costs down, you know, even before we found ourselves in this macro environment. Yeah, so you mentioned, so I was fortunate to start my career at an early stage VC firm and Union Square Ventures and learned a lot there. Um, and one thing in particular was that investors prefer funding businesses that don't really need funding. Um, and that's just sort of informed how we've run Vanta from the early days, is to grow and be aggressive, but also do so with an eye to controlling our own destiny. Um, and so one early example of that is we actually got to $10 million in revenue on just a seed round. Uh, and again, some of that were, you know, hopefully prudent business decisions. And then there's a lot of things kind of like the Costco coffee that both help cut some costs that you might be spending otherwise, and are just a helpful cultural signal to folks that, you know, hey, we're, we're here to build a business. That's what's most important. David, you know, what's your advice to startups right now in this macro environment, all of this uncertainty ahead, people comparing this to the dot-com bust? Mm -hmm. Well, this is clearly one of the top three worst downturns that Silicon Valley has seen in the last 20 years, along with the dot-com crash back in 2000 and then the Great Recession in 2008. And so I think this one is on track to be worse than 2008. I don't think it's going to be as bad as 2000. But I think founders need to be uh, aware that we are probably headed into a recession. The capital raising environment is very different than it was last year. They need to lengthen their runway. We've been advising all of our portfolio companies to try and have at least two and a half years runway because you can't wait till the very end to, to raise. So if you wanna have two years to work on your business, you actually need two and a half years of runway. So we are advising our founders, cut your burn, uh, you know, do everything you can to survive this, this downturn. And I think, you know, Vanta, one of the reasons why we wanted to invest is because they have been so incredibly capital efficient. Uh, what Christina did in terms of setting a frugal tone at the company, I think really worked. Uh, the company has one of the best uh, burn multiples we've seen. Uh, that is our metric for measuring the uh, capital efficiency of a startup. And so, you know, VCs are looking to, we're still looking to invest in high growth companies, but we also want to see capital efficiency. And so the trick for founders right now is they can't just grow, they have to grow in a capital efficient way. Christina, Tell us a little bit about your fundraising journey, given all of the market dynamics right now, your own background as a VC. What was it like being on the other side of the table? You know, did you have any moments of panic where you were worried? Are, you, are we going to be able to close this deal in this macro environment? So what I will say is that fundraising in 2022 is quite different from doing so in 2021. <laughs> Um, and go to twofold, right? There's just more scrutiny across the board this year. Uh, and then a different set of metrics. So right in 2021, it was all about revenue growth and you know, kind of how much are you growing, how quickly. Uh, and this year, uh, as David mentioned, burn multiple, a uh, big deal, right? So for every dollar of revenue you're bringing in, how much do you spend to do that? Um, gross margin, uh, burn rate, you know, runway, like, all of these questions were just kind of 
not new for us because we've been thinking about these things for the last couple of years and trying to manage them internally and keep an eye on them, but I think certainly different than the, the Series A we raised last year. David, you've been building and investing since before the dot-com bust, and I'm so curious if you think a recession is inevitable at this point. If so, is it a recession with a capital R or a lowercase r? How bad does it get? I do. I mean, I've been saying since February that I thought there were warning signs of a slowdown and possible recession. And now we have the Fed raising rates very uh, aggressively. I think they waited a year too long. We had the warning signs of inflation a year ago, and they waited nine months before doing anything. And now as a result of that, they have to overcompensate by raising rates very, very quickly. That's uh, basically causing the economy, I think, to, uh, to basically do somersaults. So I think we are headed into a recession. There's already a slowdown. We had negative 1.5% growth in the last quarter. So I think everyone should be, uh, I guess, expecting a recession. And if it doesn't materialize, and I think probably a pretty serious recession. And if it doesn't materialize, that's great news. But I think that's what founders should be expecting at this point. Which of the company, you know, you're old enough to remember, and so am I, Cisco, you know, hitting its peak in in uh, the dot-com boom and, and still hasn't recovered. Of, you know, the big established tech companies that have enjoyed this ride, do you think any of those could could become the next Cisco? Well, I think I think the, the big public companies are in much better shape than they were. The big public tech companies are in much better shape than they were during the dot-com crash. I mean, in the days of the dot-com crash, many of those companies were just kind of illusory. They didn't have real business models. They didn't have real customers. They didn't have real revenue. That's not the case today. I think what's happening today is that valuation multiples are changing. Uh, but these are real businesses. Software as a service is not going away. Uh, software businesses are still incredible businesses. They're high gross margins. Uh, they're eating more and more of the economy. They're becoming a larger and larger category of spend by enterprises on software. So I don't think that this is existential. I think this is simply a big re-rating uh, in terms of valuation multiples driven mainly by interest rates. And I think that um, you know what founders need to do is just make sure that they've given themselves the runway to persevere through uh, a recession or downturn. Christina, how do you think this is all going to impact the war for talent? I mean, obviously, you have employees probably thinking twice about whether they want to make a jump. You know, do, do, do workers want to work at startups right now, given the uncertainty? Yeah, I think, look, there's a lot of doom and gloom that we talk about, you know, with an upcoming potential recession. And, you know, I don't think it's all bad news. Uh, I think of, as we've both implied, like downturns are when some really great businesses have gotten built. Um, and I think it will actually become easier to recruit for the companies that correctly manage their burn and, you know, stick around and are able to, you know, not just persist, but almost accelerate through the downturn. David, yeah, I have to I, ask I, you. I would agree with oh, that. Go ahead. Uh, I would Go agree ahead. with that. You know, PayPal was largely built in the wake of the dot-com crash. You know, my company, Yammer, which we sold to Microsoft for unicorn valuation, that company was mainly built in the wake of the, the Great Recession of 2008. So downturns can be a great time to build enduring companies. Uh, the war for talent gets easier. Uh, there are fewer copycats getting funded, so the competition can be easier. The only thing that gets harder is fundraising. And so if you make sure that you that you raise money at the right time and you make that funding last, you lengthen your runway, then uh, you know building during a, ground, a downturn could be a great time to, to build a great company. Well, I have to ask you about your former PayPal colleague and friend, Elon Musk. He spoke to Twitter employees as, at an all-hands meeting. We got some more details about his vision for Twitter, um, the, proposing the idea that all users get verified to crack down on bots, also saying that you know he believes folks should be able to say pretty outrageous things on Twitter short of breaking the law. Um, you know, do you think he, he I, I know you've obviously been supportive of him mm -hmm. buying the company, supportive of his ideas. What do you think is going to be most uh, impactful about you know, Elon Musk potentially taking over? Well, you know, I already see a lot of outrageous things on Twitter. So I think what, what Elon is saying is that he believes in the principle of free speech and he thinks it needs to be applied in an even-handed way. I mean, we need rules created by Twitter that aren't just made up as they go along and that only affect one side of the debate. They need to be an honest, open marketplace of ideas. I think that's part of what he's saying. And then the other part that I hear is he's saying that Twitter needs to be a real business. He's saying that your costs now exceed your revenues. That's not sustainable. 
We need to cut costs. We need to grow revenue. It sounds to me like he wants to apply some business rigor to the company. And um, so I would expect that if he takes over the company, there will be some cost cutting. It sounds like, you know, he believes in in-person work. He said that uh, he would prefer that people be in the office, although exceptions be made for, you know, truly exceptional cases. But I would expect him to apply some business rigor. And that's half of what he would do. And the other half is, um, is basically creating some predictable rules around speech. Now, there are some doubts as to whether he's really committed to doing this deal, whether he's using bots. We had a former Twitter employee on earlier who believes he's using this bot issue to try to get out of it, that he's not really serious, that he doesn't necessarily really want it. Do you think he's, is he serious? Is he committed to buying Twitter? Well, the fact he did this town hall with the employees today actually is, is a sign to me that the deal is actually likely to happen. I agree that there was some question a few weeks ago about whether it was actually going to happen. But I think the fact that he did this meeting with the employees leads me to believe it's more likely than not that it's actually going to happen, that he intends to follow through with it. So, you know, I don't know anything uh, that he hasn't said publicly about it, but I would take that as a signal.